Welcome everyone. This is part two in our series on grounded language understanding. Our task for this unit is essentially a natural language generation task. And I've called those speakers. The idea is that speakers go from the world, that is some non-linguistic thing that they're trying to communicate about into language. Those are really the central agents that we'll be exploring. To ground all this, we're gonna have a simple task. I'm gonna start with the most basic version of the task that we'll ultimately tackle in our assignment and Bake Off, and that is color reference. So these are examples taken from a corpus that was originally correct, collected by Randall Monroe of XKCD fame and processed into an NLP task by McMahon and Stone 2015. Uh, and it's a simple formulation in that the state of the world we wanna communicate about is a color patch. And the task is simply to produce descriptions of those color patches. And I've given some examples here and you can see that they range from simple one word descriptions uh, all the way up to things that are kind of complicated both cognitively and linguistically. And I think point to the idea that even though this is a simple and constrained domain, it's a pretty cognitively and linguistically interesting one. So our speakers, uh, at least our baseline speakers are standard versions of encoder decoder models. We're gonna have for this initial formulation a very simple encoder. The task of the encoder is simply to take a color representation, which is gonna be a list of floats, embed it in some embedding space, and then learn some hidden representation for that color. And that's all that needs to happen. So it's just one step. The decoder is where the speaking part happens. So the initial token produced by the decoder, by the speaker, is always the start token, which is looked up in an embedding space. And then we get our first decoder hidden state, which is created from the color representation as the initial hidden state in the sequence we're going to build together with an embedding. And both of those have weight transformations, and it's an additive combination of them that delivers this value H1 here. Then we use some softmax parameters to make a prediction about the next token. Here we've predicted dark. And we get our error signal by comparing that prediction with the actual token that occurred in our training data. In this case, it was the word light. So since we've made a wrong prediction, we're going to get a substantive error signal that will then, we hope, update the weight parameters throughout this model in a way that leads them to produce better generations the next time. In a little more detail, just as a reminder, so we have an embedding for that start token and indeed for all tokens. The hidden state is derived from the embedding via a weight transformation and the color representation, which is state H0 in the recurrence that we're building. And that too has a transformation applied to it to travel through the hidden layer. Uh, that gives us the state H1. And then we have softmax parameters on top of that H1 that make a prediction. Uh, the prediction that they make is a prediction over the entire vocabulary. And the probability of the actual token gives us our error signal. So the probability of light is the error signal that we'll use here to update the model parameters. And then we begin with the next time step. I've called this teacher forcing because in the standard mode, which is the teacher forcing mode, even though we predicted dark at time step one, we're gonna have as our second token, the, the, the token light, uh, which is the actual token in the underlying training data. And when we proceed as though we did not make a mistake. So again, we do an embedding lookup. We get our second hidden state for the decoder as a combination of the embedding X37 and the previous hidden state. And we make another prediction. And in this case, our prediction is blue and that's the actual token and life is good for a little bit. And then we proceed with a third time step. The actual token is blue, H3, and we predict green. And in this case, we should have predicted the stop token, which would cause us to stop processing the sequence. We're just gonna get an error signal as we standardly would and propagate that back down through the model in hopes that the next time when we wanna stop, we'll actually produce this stop token that I've given up here. At prediction time, of course, the sequence is not given, that doesn't change the encoder because the color representation is part of the model inputs, but then we have to decode and just describe without any feedback. So we proceed as we did before and we predict dark here. And then dark has to become the token at the next time step because we don't know what the ground truth is. And we proceed as before and say blue. And then that becomes the third time step. And with luck there in that third position, we predict the stop token and the decoding process is completed. That is the fundamental model. Uh, even though it's simple, it admits of many interesting modifications. Let me just mention a few of them. First, the encoder and the decoder, of course, could have many more hidden layers. Mine just had one, but they could be very deep networks. We would expect that the layer counts for the encoder and the decoder and match so that you have this even handoff from encoder to decoder across all the hidden layers. But even that's not a hard constraint. I can imagine that some pooling or copying 
could accommodate different numbers of layers in these two components. It's very common at present for researchers to tie the embedding and classifier parameters, right? The embedding gives us a representation for every vocabulary item, and the transpose of that can serve as the set of parameters for our, for our uh, softmax classifier when we predict tokens. Uh, and tying those weights seems to be very productive in terms of optimization effectiveness. So you might consider that. And finally, during training, we might drop that teacher forcing assumption, which would mean that in a small percentage of cases, we would allow the model to just proceed as though its predicted token was the correct token for the next time step, even if that was a faulty assumption. On the, on the idea that that might help the model explore a wider range of the space and inject its um, generations with some helpful diversity. And then there's one other modification that I want to mention, because you'll see this as part of the homework and the system that you're developing. So we found that in Monroe et al. 2016, it was helpful to kind of remind the decoder at each one of its time steps about what it was trying to describe. So in more detail, we had HSV color representations as our inputs. We did a Fourier transform to get an embedding, and that was processed into a hidden state. And then during decoding, we appended to each one of the embeddings the Fourier transformation representation of the color as a kind of informal reminder at each time step about what the input was actually like on the assumption that for long sequences, when we get all the way down to the end, the model might have a hazy memory of what it's trying to describe. And this functions as a kind of reminder at that point. And that proved to be very effective and I'll encourage you to explore that in the homework. And then I hope you can see that even though this task formulation is simple, it's an instance of a wide range of tasks that we might explore under the heading of grounding. After all, for grounding in this sense, we just need some non-linguistic representation coming in, and the idea is that we'll generate language in response to that input. So image captioning is an instance of this. Scene description, of course, is another instance. Visual question answering is a slight modification where the input is not just an image, but also a question text and the idea is that you want to produce an answer to that question relative to the image input. And then instruction giving would be a more general form where the input is some kind of state description and the idea is that we want to offer a complicated instruction on that basis. And I think we can think of many others that would fit into this mold and benefit not only from the encoder decoder architecture, but also from conceptualization explicitly as grounded natural language generation tasks.